Welcome to another edition of Thunderdome, everybody. Today we're going over 5.1, the president and the vice president. Follow along with the quiz 5.1, located on Canvas. Okay, here we go. Maybe. Okay, so, the president. Who is this person? Um, leader of the executive branch, what does the executive branch do? It enforces the laws. That is the job of the executive branch. Uh, so he's possibly the top political job in the country, maybe the world. I mean, we know it's the top political job in the country, possibly the world. George Washington was the first to hold office. Uh, and right now, um, you know, next week, we'll be voting for our 46th president. Um, so we are very current in what's happening here. Um, all right. So qualifications for president, um, so we have constitutional requirements, and this is listed in Article 2 of the Constitution. Be at least 35 years old. So that means that there's only one person that can be president in this room, and it happens to be me. I'm 36. Be a native-born American citizen. Native-born. Not what? born outside of the United States and become a U.S. citizen, you can't be president. So that's kind of an interesting thing. There could be people who would have loved for that to happen. Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, Alexander Hamilton, um, but they were not uh, born uh, as an American citizen. Uh, and you have to be a resident of the United States for at least 14 years. So those are the three things that are requirements. Um, so if you can see this uh, little image that we have, no person except a natural born citizen or a citizen of the United States at the time of the adoption of this Constitution shall be eligible to the office of president. Neither shall any person be eligible to that office who shall not have attained the age of 35 years and been 14 years a resident within the United States. So that's the actual verbiage of Article 2 saying the requirements for the president. So, um, electing a president. So, every four years, currently, you know, our president is Donald Trump. Uh, he's running for re election uh, for his second term. And we are officially one week away from the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November. That, that yeah, that is whenever we vote uh, for our president, it's called a general election. Um, so the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November. This is interesting because they kind of, this has to do with when the seat, the reason it's in November and the reason it's the time it, it, it is is because it has to do with farmers off season. Right? The harvest is done so they can get to the, the polls, and that's why it was made to be at this time. Uh, so how do we elect a president? We have the Electoral College, so it's an indirect method of election set up by the Constitution. So you mark, we vote, right? the people vote, and then electors actually represent our vote every time we vote. So um, by marking their ballots for a particular candidate, voters are actually selecting their state's electors. The electors are pledged to vote for the chosen candidate. They're only pledged to vote. They could break the word if they want to, but they don't. Because if they did that, then we wouldn't have faith in our democracy anymore. Okay? Um, so electing a president. Each state has many electoral votes, uh, as many as electoral votes as the total members of Congress. So representatives plus senators equals electoral votes. We have 13 representatives in the House of Representatives, right? And we have two senators, which brings North Carolina to 15. That's a pretty decent number. North Carolina is a pretty huge swing state, okay? Uh, so this means that states with larger populations have more electoral votes, which makes sense because they have more people, okay? So it's a winner-take-all system. In almost all states but two, uh, the candidate who wins the popular vote 
the people's vote, and each state receives all of that state's electoral votes. North Carolina in 2016 was almost split directly down the middle. Okay? Um, but all you need is to have 51% of the votes, and you get all 15 of the electoral votes. It is a winner take all system. So even if the candidate wins by only a small majority, they get all the votes. How many votes do you need to win the presidency? 270. 270 out of 538 electoral votes. Now, why is it 538 instead of 535? Because Washington, D.C. was given three electoral votes based on its population. So uh, this is the presidential election in 2000, so Al Gore versus George Bush. Now, check this out. And this happened again in 2016. Who won the popular vote in 2016? Hillary Clinton. Who won the presidency? Donald Trump. More people voted for Hillary Clinton, but the Electoral College and the system of us and how we vote Donald Trump wins because he wins the electoral votes. This happened in 2000 as well. So George Bush got 271 electoral college votes, which is one more than he needed. <clears throat> but he lost the popular vote by a couple hundred thousand people. So more people voted for Al Gore, but George Bush, George Bush won the election. This has happened several times, all right? And it could happen again. Uh, so yeah, there we go. Uh, there's Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump there. Um, but you can see that uh, Hillary Clinton got 65 million votes and Donald Trump got 62 million votes. Uh, she got 48% of the population, and Donald Trump got 45.9% of the population. But, um, again, it comes down to the electoral votes. So, people get pretty upset about that. Um, all right, a cartoon analysis here. Why do you think the framers uh, chose to use the electoral college to elect the president? Think about the type of men who wrote the Constitution. They probably came from big states, uh, represented states, right? Uh, describe the message that the cartoon conveys about uh, presidential elections. Um, well, what it means is some states are more important than others. So you have swing states where people live um, in great numbers. And you know, Florida, we're talking about 20-some votes. Virginia, same thing. Ohio, same thing. Those are the places where presidents or candidates to become president, they go there and they fight to get those votes because if they know they win that state, then they have a better opportunity to win. Uh, terms of office or term of office, so they serve four-year terms. Uh, the 22nd Amendment limits each president to two elected terms or a maximum of 10 years. But if we add two terms together, that equals eight years. So they can only be president for the maximum of 10 years. So let's say that um, I get elected in 2016, right? My vice president is Brian. Um, and in 2018, I get assassinated. Brian takes over, right? So he's going to be a president for the last two years of my term. Then he's going to run for re-election again, and he wins. That's four more years. And then he runs for re-election one more time, and he wins. That's four more years. That's a total of eight years. Now, what if I got assassinated in 2016, right after I got elected? Would he be able to run for president two more times? No. So, um, so, 22nd Amendment limits each president to two elected terms. Uh, if the president took office during another president's term, this is where this happens. It has happened several times before. Assassinations, deaths, all that kind of stuff. Um, all right. 
Uh, salary and benefits, the, the president receives a, a yearly salary of $400,000 plus money for expenses and travel. And that's taxpayer money, right? Um, $400,000 really doesn't seem like uh, a lot compared to what we know um, what celebrities make or anything like that, right? I mean, $400,000, you've met somebody who's made $400,000 in a year. I know you have. Somewhere somewhere out there in the world, that's not too hard to realize that it's like, okay, in passing, you've met somebody who's made $400,000 a year. That's what the president makes. Remember, Congress only makes $170,000 a year. Uh, the president lives and works in the White House. We know that. A staff tends to the needs of the president's family. Um, they have a place called Camp David. It's an estate in Maryland. Uh, it serves as the president's retreat and a place to host foreign leaders. Um, so the presidents travel in special cars, helicopters, and airplanes such as Air Force One. Uh, the helicopter is called Marine One, and the special limousine is called what? Does anybody know? The Beast, which is crazy, but that's how it is. Um, the vice president elected uh, with the president. Um, so. That happened in the 12th, Amend uh, the 12th Amendment. Before that, the vice president was elected separately. It was just the runner-up. So you ran for president, and then the runner-up was your vice president? That'd, that'd be weird, wouldn't it? The 12th Amendment says that the president gets to pick his vice president. So qualifications are the same for both jobs. You've got to be 35. All right? You've got to live uh, in the United States for 14 years. You've got to be born a citizen. Um, the vice president votes in the Senate in case of a tie. We already covered that. Um, otherwise, he has little authority. He pretty much just works for the president. If the president can't show up somewhere, he sends the, the vice president. Uh, the vice president, pres, president can become president if the president dies, is removed from office, becomes seriously, seriously ill, or resigns. And all of that has happened. All right? Presidential secession, just meaning the order of people who become president. Let's say that if somebody bombs Washington, D.C., and several people of high office end up um, not surviving. Okay, who becomes president if the president and the vice president, the Speaker of the House, the president pro tempore? What happens if they all die or can't serve? So we have the Presidential Secession Act of 1947. So in the Constitution it says, the Vice President takes on the powers and duties of the Presidency. Does the Vice President become, or does the Vice President become President or just take over the President's duties but remain as Vice President? Um, this answered that. So the Presidential Secession Act of 1947 established the line of secession after the Vice President. So first it goes Vice President. So the president dies, who's the president? Vice president. Okay, the vice president dies, who's the president? Speaker of the house. Speaker of the house dies, who's the president? President pro tempore. The president pro tempore dies, then it gets into the cabinet members, and the first cabinet member is the secretary of state. And then it goes down the line. And you can see this right here. So after the secretary of state, it goes secretary of the treasury, secretary of the defense, attorney general, uh, which is just the um, head of the Department of Justice, Secretary of the uh, Interior, Agriculture, Commerce, Labor, Health and Human Services, Housing and Urban Development, Transportation, Energy, Education, Veterans Affairs, and Homeland Security. Um, so, you might have heard a term called the designated survivor before, have you? There is a time where all these people are in the same place at one time. It is called the State of the Union Address. You've heard of that. You've flipped to the channels and not been able to escape it before. One of these people is taken out of that place and put in a safe place, like a bunker or something like that, while that is actually happening. And that, for the reason of, okay, what if something happens during the State of the Union Address? We have this one person who will become president waiting in, in the wings over here, safe. Uh, presidential secession continued. The 25th Amendment uh, established in 1967. If a president cannot serve, the vice president becomes president. And this could happen 
because he's ill, okay, or something like that. Um, the new president then chooses another vice president, but both houses of Congress must approve the choice. House of, houses of, the House of Representatives and the Senate must approve the new vice president that is chosen. So, uh, this gives the vice president a role in determining if the president is disabled, unable to do the job. The vice president would serve as acting president until the president is able to go back to work. Presidents have become sick. Presidents have not been able to fulfill their duties, and in those moments, the vice president steps in and does their job for them. And we have now completed 